Examine more closely this determination of n lies just as much in the notion of the thing that of being in its own self an end. That is to say, it preserves itself. That is, it is at one and the same time its nature to conceal the necessity and to exhibit it in the form of a contingent relation. For its freedom or its being for self is just this, to treat the necessity of the relation as of no importance. Thus, it presents itself as something whose notion falls outside of its being. Similarly, reason has of necessity to look on its own notion as falling outside of it. Hence, as a thing, as something towards which it is indifferent, and which is therefore reciprocally indifferent towards reason and its notion. As instinct, reason also remains at the level of mere being and a state of indifference, and the thing expressing the notion remains for it something other than this notion, and the notion other than the thing. Thus, for reason, the organic thing is in its own self an end only in the sense that the necessity which presents itself is hidden in the action of the thing, for this behaves as an indifferent being for self, falls outside of the organism itself. Since, however, the organism as an end in its own self cannot behave in any other way than as an organism, the fact that it is an end in itself is also manifest and present in sensuous fashion and it is as such that it is observed. The organism shows itself to be a being that preserves itself, that returns and has returned into itself. But this observing consciousness does not recognize in this being the notion of end, or that the notion of end exists just here and in the form of a thing, and not elsewhere in some other intelligence. It makes a distinction between the notion of end and being for self and self-preservation, a distinction which is none. That it is in fact no distinction is something of which this consciousness is not aware. On the contrary, the making of the distinction appears to it as a contingent act having no essential connection with what is brought about by that act. And the unity which links the two together, that is, the said act and the end, falls asunder for this consciousness. Here in paragraph 259, we're really in the heart of the observing reason section, and I want to remind us of, of something. The observing goes both ways. There's sort of a ambiguity that, that might even be intentional uh, if we want to attribute it to Hegel, because what we're looking at is reason as a mode of consciousness, a shape of consciousness, as it is observing, in this case, the, the organism and the, the end, right? But we're also, ourselves, as the readers, following along with Hegel, the phenomenologist, we are observing that reason that is carrying out this observation. So there is a duality of perspective here. Reason, in this sense, is seeing things in a certain way, and Hegel will tell us what it's actually not grasping. Uh, and this is going to continue through several paragraphs. Uh, but we're seeing what is being missed or, or left out. So we have a fuller picture than does the observing reason, although observing reason is where the real action is at, you might say. So... He begins this paragraph by saying, examine more closely this determination of end lies just as much in the notion of the thing that of being in its own self an end. We just saw in the previous paragraphs how an organism uh, doesn't merely have a teleological relation in the sense of being given an end external to it. It has its own teleology you know, implicit in, in its own being, made explicit through what Hegel calls action, you know, tun, uh, or tat sometimes, it's going to be two different, you know, uses, verb, noun. Um, and the end of the organism is to continue its own existence and, if possible, to augment its own existence. It does so in relation to its other, which is its environment, right? So Hegel is going on with this, and he says um, it preserves itself. It is, at, it is at one and the same time its nature to conceal the necessity and to exhibit it in the form of a contingent relation. So that is what we've got right here. So 
The organism is related to nature, and it has a given degree of freedom of being for itself. That is, it's not necessarily um, self-conscious in a discursive way that we, we might point to, but it is aware of how its environment and the things of its environment, the objects that it engages with, affect it. And it has certain things, you know, uh, you know, certain responses. And these responses are not just blind, dumb, instinctual things. It, it has a certain degree of freedom in, in what it does. Now, this freedom is not what we would call the freedom of, of choice in the sense of, uh, I, you know, I spell out for myself option A, and then I spell out for myself option B, and I ponder a while, which of these options shall I pursue? Hegel is not saying that it's that sort of freedom. But it does have a capacity to, to be greater than what is impinging upon it, you might say, what is determining it. And so um, the organism itself is expressing a kind of internal necessity in its relation to nature, which is also, um, you know, where the organism itself is, right? So what I've got here is sort of an unfolding uh, through its own action. But it displays this as contingent. Contingent to who? To the organism? No, because the organism is not part, you know, all that worried about necessity and contingency. The organism is concerned with eating, copulating, laying in the sun, staying alive, all those sorts of things. So who is this you know, determination of contingency or necessity important for? It's not for the organism. It's for observing reason, right? Observing reason is interested in the difference between these. Because observing reason wants to, in a certain way, master the organism, make it its own, because it thinks that the whole world is for it, as we've seen. All right, so he goes on and he says, its freedom, uh, or its being for self, is just this, to treat the necessity of the relation as no importance, so it presents itself as something whose notion falls outside of its being. Right? So the notion of organism lies outside of the being of the organism, except perhaps for reason, which can grasp it. Now, notice what he's going to say here. There's a similar mirroring going on Reason looks at the, the organism and perhaps says, oh, the silly bastards, they have no idea what they're doing, those little hoppy frogs jumping around, eating the flies, you know, avoiding herons, etc., 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 right? Reason doesn't realize that it itself is involved in doing something quite similar. So that's what we have up here. Um, he goes on and he says, reason has of necessity to look at its own, uh, on its own notion as falling outside of it, hence as a thing. So what we've got here is a sort of triadic relation between reason, which is itself carrying out an action, Reason, uh, Hegel is saying also at this point, is unfolding itself in terms of its instinct. It is not yet what we might call critical reason, right? It's, it's not reason in its full extent, but it's, it's pretty powerful. It's more powerful than the other organisms and what they do. So reason, he says, looks at its own notion as falling outside of it, a thing, something towards which it is indifferent, and which is therefore reciprocally indifferent towards reason and its notion. So what does this mean? He tells us in the next section. Reason remains at the level of mere being and a state of indifference. And the thing expressing the notion remains for it something other than this notion and the notion other than this thing. We have a schism here between the notion and the thing. And what we're seeing here is the very beginnings of reason attempting to notice what it is itself engaged in and to become more self-conscious. Now, where this is going to get developed is, is primarily going to be in the later sections, not, not in this section itself. 
that Hegel is pointing this, this out to us, this important development. So he says, for reason, the organic thing is its own self, is in its own self an end only in the sense that the necessity which presents itself is hidden from the action of the thing, for this behaves as an indifferent being for self, falls outside of the organism itself. The necessity seems not to be there in the organism. So where is the necessity? Maybe over here in the notion of the organism, right? He goes on and he says, um, since the organism as an end in its own self cannot behave in any other way than as an organism, the fact that it is an end in itself is also manifest and present in sensuous fashion. And it is such that it is observed. So observing reason takes in uh, what is not hidden, the organism displaying itself to be an end. But in the way that it does so is through what it actually does that's observable, not the what we might call hidden teleology uh, by which we can explain why it's doing what it's doing. So, you know, to make this very concrete, um, <clears throat> I brought up frogs. Let me use an example, actually, from um, my, my childhood. We had uh, frogs in a cage, and we would feed them flies. This is back in, <clears throat> back in grade school. And um, everything went great until wintertime, because in a Wisconsin winter, you don't have an awful lot of flies. As a matter of fact, most of the insects die. <clears throat> and normally what a frog would do is hibernate during winter, right? There's no food supply. It can't keep itself alive. Um, you know, there's no, no flies to, to reproduce. Uh, its environment becomes, in a certain sense, what was a good environment for it, a warm environment, becomes a hostile environment because now it's going to lack its, its sustenance, right? So now think about this in terms of teleology. Um, the, the organism, the frog, has a, a desire to, perp, to, to maintain itself in existence in relation to its environment. It would do so if it were cool enough by hibernating. Uh, it can't do that. And it also can't do what it would like to do in its environment, which is to you know, shoot its tongue out and get flies and eat them up. Um, we used to catch flies and put them inside the frog's cage. And we told our teacher, hey, you got to like put this frog maybe in a cool spot like in the basement so it can hibernate. And he insisted, no, uh, we're not going to do that. I think perhaps he wanted to see what would happen. And the frog became more and more skeletal and eventually died. Um, now, how does, how does that fit in here? What did we actually observe with our senses? We saw the frog getting skinnier. We saw a lack of flies, if you can see a lack with your senses. We, we sensed the heat. Putting all that together requires going somewhat beyond the senses about things that are grasped through the senses. You don't see the teleology the same way that you see a frog shoot its tongue out and, you know, consume the fly. But you do cognize the teleology through observation, the teleology involved in, in this, this particular organism. You might say for the fly, you know, terrible teleology, right? doesn't want to be eaten. So he goes on and he says... Um, the, the end is itself manifest and present in sensuous fashion. As such, it's observed. The organism shows itself to be a being that preserves itself, that returns and has returned into itself. But this observing consciousness does not recognize in this being the notion of end, or that the notion of end exists just here and in the form of a thing. So we have, again, the notion of the organism as end, the notion of reason itself as end, is not being grasped, not as such. So he, he says, um, exists here in the form of a thing, not elsewhere in some other intelligence. It makes a distinction between the notion of end and being for self and self-preservation. This is a distinction which is not. Hegel is saying, you know, you can distinguish between teleology, the notion of end, and the action of, of self-preservation, but they really are connected with each other. 
So he says that, in, that it is, in fact, no distinction is something of which his consciousness is not aware. So this is where we are, you might say, up here, right? We're not on the chalkboard looking in on reason as it's looking at everything else. What are we talking about here? We're talking about um, what we observe when we ourselves are in this mode of reason, what we observe when we see other people doing this in the present. We're also talking about the development that took place of consciousness in the past. So he says um, that it is in fact no distinction is something of which his consciousness is not aware. On the contrary, the making of the distinction appears to it as a contingent act having no essential connection with what is brought about by that act. The unity which links the two together, the act and the end, falls asunder for this consciousness. What we have here is consciousness not truly recognizing its own self as it's working out the, you know, what reason is in relation to the world through reason's distinctive action guided by its instinctuality. On this view, what belongs to the organism itself is the action lying in the middle between its first and last stage, so far as this action bears within it the character of singleness. So far, however, as the action has the character of universality and the agent of the action is equated with the outcome of that action, purpose of action as such would not belong to the organism. That single action, which is only a means, comes through its singleness under the category of an altogether single or contingent necessity. What an organism does to preserve itself as an individual or as a genus is, therefore, as regards this immediate content, quite uncontrolled by any law, for the universal and the notion fall outside of it. Accordingly, its activity would be an empty activity devoid of any content of its own. It would not, e not be even the activity of a machine, for this had a purpose, and its activity therefore a specific content. Deserted in this way by the universal, it would be the activity merely of something immediate qua immediate. That is, an activity like that of an acid or base, which is not at the same time reflected into itself. An activity which could not separate itself from its immediate existence, nor give up this existence, which gets lost in the relation to its opposite, and still preserve itself. But the thing whose activity is under consideration here is posited as a thing that preserves itself in its relation to its opposite. The activity as such is nothing but the pure essenceless form of its being for self and its substance, which is not merely a determinate being, but the universal or its end does not fall outside of it. It is an activity which spontaneously returns into itself and is not turned back into itself by anything alien to it. In paragraph 260, Hegel is continuing this, this watching how observing reason makes sense out of the organism in terms of teleology, and particularly here in terms of action. What he's going to show us here is, you might say, two sides of action that are being split off from each other, two different perspectives. Um, and he's dwelling on, on the one here that seems to be, in many respects, from a philosophical perspective, less promising. But he's doing so to try to show us what happens when we take a universal and concept, you know, Hegelian concept or notion-based, but greatly uh, um, way of looking at things out of the picture. So he talks uh, in terms of a first, and it's translated here in Miller's first stage, but it's just Ersta and, and last, uh, Lexta, and then in between them, you might say mediating them, uh, going from first to last, is, is the action, right? So he says, um, on this view, what belongs to the organism itself, what belongs to the organism is the, the action. Although the first is also the organism. The last is also the organism. Uh, it's the action that is, that is combining them, you might say, mediating between the two stages. But the action, and I should put this this way, the action really, you might say, from a teleological perspective, encompasses them. Because what is the, the organism doing? It is maintaining its own being, as Hegel has said in, in previous paragraphs. There's a necessity that was there from the beginning, 
and is being unfolded, right? What's, what's there, uh, what, what appears is what was already there. So he goes on and he says, this action bears within it the character of singleness. That's what makes it lie in between here. That's where we get to something really interesting. So what are we talking about with this character of singleness and character of universality? So action is always, in a certain respect, in an ontological way, individual action, singular, particular action, right? Uh, you know, Aristotle told us that. Uh, we don't need Hegel to, to necessarily bring that up. On the other hand, insofar as we perceive action as something intelligible, insofar as we can talk about it, insofar as we can conceptualize it, insofar as we can see it as purposive, zvak messige, uh, literally sort of measured to or proportionate to the end, the zvak action, there is a kind of universality to it. And so we've got this interesting interplay between the, the particular or the single, the einzeln, and the universal, the, the allgemein. And for an organism, an actual existing organism, not just an imagined organism, right? Um, the movement from the first to the last, from the agent to the result, which is the continuance of that agent, happens through single action. Insofar as it's merely single, it becomes trivial. It becomes meaningless. Let's see what Hegel actually says here. He says, Purpose of action, as such, would not belong to the organism because purpose of the purposivity of action comes about because of its character of universality. The single action, which is only a means, comes through its singleness under the category, as he says, now here's a really interesting phrase, of a single or contingent necessity. A contingent necessity. A single necessity. Contingent necessity jumps out at you more quickly as being something like an oxymoron, or at the very least a paradox. But single necessity should do that as well, especially if we're thinking in terms of laws, right? Because laws are supposed to cover all of the phenomena, not just an individual. What else does he say? It's uncontrolled by any law. Again, because laws are not supposed to admit of exceptions. We saw all of this in the force and the understanding section. We've had it reinforced to us in the earlier discussions of law. He calls it an empty activity devoid of content of its own. That's important as well. He doesn't say it's entirely devoid of content, but it's devoid of content of its own, something that would be you know, uh, determinative for it and would stand out. The irony here is that... Um, Empty activity devoid of content of its own is understood for the thing that is single, einzel, on its own, right? So it lacks, by being totally isolated out, which is the perspective that we're often tempted to take as observing reason, we trivialize, we, we exhaust, we, we suck out the meaning of things. He goes on and he says, it becomes something merely immediate, qua immediate. And he contrasts it and compares it against two other things. The organism in this case is not even like a machine because every machine, insofar as it's a machine, has a teleology to it. It, ha it is some sort of purposiveness, not a purposiveness that it understands itself, but a purposiveness that the maker of the machine put into it. That's why it, it's a machine, even if it's just a lever, right? The other thing that he compares it to is the actions of, of acids and bases, which just do what they do. And, you know, if you want to go further and ask, well, why do they do what they do? You, you know, you can give a chemical explanation, um, and you can keep on pushing it further and further down. But at a certain level, you just get, that's just the way it is. That's just what happens. And there, there isn't any sort of greater intelligibility in terms of why things have to be the way they are. Causality, right? So what is going on here? This appears really bad, doesn't it? 
we, we've now seemingly lost sight of what was really interesting about organisms. He goes on and he says, the thing whose activity is under consideration here is posited as a thing that preserves itself in relation to its opposite. That is going to be the leading clue to take us out of here. The activity as such is nothing but the pure essenceless form of its being for self, its substance, which is not a, merely a determinate being, but the universal or its end does not fall outside of it. So Hegel is saying, yes, we can split these perspectives off, but the action really does have both of these characters to it. That splitting off is, in a certain way, something artificial that, that's occurring. So he goes on and he says, um, it's an activity which spontaneously returns to itself, is not turned back into itself by anything alien to it. And now it sounds like we're back on, on track with um, you know, organisms that are the ends uh, in themselves, not in a Kantian way, but, but in, in you know, the, the, the way that they, they keep themselves going through their own activity. Um, but this should be rather troublesome, this this fact that when we do separate off the individual as individual and their action, the self-preserving action, suddenly it seems to lose any sort of real determinateness. Uh, the, the necessity that it has is merely a contingent necessity. So let's see where he goes from here then. However, this unity of universality and the activity does not exist for this observing consciousness because that unity is essentially the inner movement of the organism and can only be grasped as notion. But observation seeks the moments in the form of being of enduring being and because the nature of what is organically a whole is such that the moments are not contained in it, nor can be found in, it in that form, consciousness converts the antithesis into one that conforms to its point of view. Paragraph 261 is very short, and in it Hegel is sort of bringing together the movement that has happened in the last several paragraphs, not only the ones contained in this particular commentary video, but the paragraphs before that as well. And he's talking about what is grasped from the position of observing consciousness. And I should probably put in here, so, you know, I've been mentioning that what's going on is observing reason is being watched by the phenomenologist phenomenologist who is um, not only observing what observing reason is doing but also what observing reason is not catching and that's what Hegel is talking about here so he says that um, this unity of universality and the activity Right? What, what is this universe, this, this unity of, it's a unity of, of the, you might say, perspective of purpose and the perspective of the single uh, beings, the organisms, activity, of uh, self-preservation. These are actually unified, but observing consciousness ends up splitting them apart into two different aspects and isn't really satisfied with either because with the universality grasping the purpose it loses hold on the single being and grasping the activity as we just saw in the previous paragraph it loses hold on the meaning the purposiveness of it and you know what's what's the the issue well it's trying to grasp them in terms of enduring being or like i put here a, a static perspective right and why is it doing so um, Hegel's not, not spelling this out at this point, but this is the difference between, say, a, a philosophy of the understanding and a philosophy of the concept. Keep that in, in the back of your mind as we move through all this. Hegel says that the universality and the action or the activity um, are, have to be grasped as a notion, as a concept, as a big right? And he says, Obser observation seeks them in the form of enduring being. Because the nature of what is organically a whole is such that, is such that the moments are not contained in it, nor can be found in that form, consciousness converts this antithesis or, or you know, opposition into one that conforms to its point of view, and thereby, you might say, falsifies it. 
What's really going on is that there's a dynamic inner movement involved in every organism, in every organic being, and that is what observing reason has not yet grasped. It's being posed to it as a sort of scandal or stumbling block, although as we're going to see, there's going to now be an attempt to try to make sense of this. 